recording it's recording the right screen all right so this is the uh, console you know uh, of Firefox I believe Chrome has a very similar interface and Microsoft Edge is Chrome okay just rebranded you know by Microsoft so I think they all have about the same user interface if not just install Firefox it's free it's open source so uh, so now you can you know, start to use um, uh, JavaScript your code here interactively okay which is one really good thing about JavaScript as opposed to C++ or Java or Java is not compiled it is interpreted which means you can interact with the environment as you go okay so the first thing I'm going to do is to say let okay so this is how you can you know start to define uh, variables in the program uh, let is useful inside a local scope in the outside scope it's not as useful but inside the a block let basically says the variable is local to the block itself there's also var which means it is local to the function you know that the ver the, de the definition where the definition is but let is local to a you know block you know marked by braces so it's it's a better way to control the scope of variables so i'm just going to say you know in this case we'll have x equal to okay and i'm going to say new set okay and set is uh, a built-in type you don't have to include anything else to use the type of set and inside your set you can initialize it so i'm going to initialize it to um, an example that we have gone through already uh, that would be two four and six in this case and then press the enter key the return type is undefined because you know, we are basically having a declaration of a variable and initializing at initializing it at the same time you can always ask you what is x and then press the enter key and even without pressing the enter key it tells you that set has three elements in it and those are respectively two four and six but remember the ordering is not important okay so it could have listed the content of the set as six to four four six two in whatever order you know that is that still contains the three elements all right so next thing is i want to initialize y so now we say let y equals to another set and in this case it has the elements two and three in it press the enter key same thing okay but if you ask what y is it tells you right away that y has two elements being two and three is that okay all right so the next thing I want to do is to show you how to use a loop to go through every element in a particular set. Um, unlike C++, there are many for loops in JavaScript, okay, to iterate through different kind of stuff. So in this case, uh, one thing I can do is to ask, you know, what is x dot values, okay? So values is a function, or I should say it's a, it's a method of a set so every set has a fun has a um, has a method called values and all it does is to tell you uh, it's an iterator okay and you can go through an iterator using a for loop so now you can say for and in here we can say const e and then you use of okay x dot values and inside the loop, I'm all I'm going to do is to kind of print out the value that is being examined in that iteration. So the way to print out something is console.log. And then in console.log, I can now specify just E itself. And that's the entire loop. Press the enter key. And now it prints out two, four, six, because those are the elements of uh, the set X. Is that okay? So syntactically, it just has some. I would say eye candy okay you know so that it's easy to specify i just want to go through everything through an iterator is everybody comfortable with the concept of an iterator yes hopefully okay very good <clears throat> all right so now the, the idea is what about there exist versus um for all okay you know how do those things apply so we'll go ahead and you know use an example here so let's say we want to see whether um, whether everything in X 
is an even number. Okay, that's a pretty easy thing to do. Okay, so how do we know that for all e in x, x uh, for all e in x, e is an even number? So we want to express that, you know, as a program. Yes, go ahead. You would use mod, right? would use mod in, at the very core portion of it, but the control structure is what is where the interesting part is. Okay, so we're going to do it like this. Okay, we'll use a really long block statement, um, and I'm going to create. I'm creating a block statement as we go, so this is going to be really long, like lengthwise. <clears throat> we'll have a local variable called result. And result is initialized in this case. Now, I'm dealing with a universal quantifier this time. So result is initialized to true to begin with. In other words, unless proven otherwise, the universal quantifier is going to say, why not? Yes. OK? So now we have to go through all the elements and do something with all the elements. So now we have the same constru uh, construct like last time, you know, uh, for const e of x dot values. So this loop is iterating through every single element in the set x. And then we have nested uh, braces here so that I can do something for each element in the set, which you know, has the variable name of e bound to it at this point. So what do we want to do is we want to say result is, oops, result and, now we have to specify that operation, you know, that uses mod, yep. So it's gonna be E mod two equals to zero, okay? Because, you know, if E is an even number, then the remainder of E divided by two should be a zero. Now there are, uh, two different types of equality in JavaScript. In this case, you know, it is probably safer to use triple equal to because double equal to means you, know, you can leave it up to the interpreter to do type promotion. Okay? You can, it will, if you give the equality double equal two different things that are of different types, then double equal will try its best to type cast one side or the other so they can give you something that's comparable which means false, zero, the empty string, null, and undefined can be used in certain cases interchangeably, which is not good, okay, not in this case. So in this case, we really just want to compare the result of the mod with the numerical value of zero. So triple equal is actually proper in this case. And when this is all done, okay, you know, I'm going after the uh, loop structure here. So with a semicolon, I can now separate you know, to the next statement. So in this case, I'm just going to use console.log to reflect the actual result. Are we doing okay so far with this chunk of code? I know it looks really ugly because there are a few statements, you know, including some blocks, but I'm putting everything on the same line because I'm doing, doing this interactively. So I don't have the option of you know, multi-line programs, not easily in this case. Are we good so far? Okay, so we press the enter key and it says it's true. We go like, okay, what, what if we change the set of X so that it also includes you know, something that um, is not an even number, okay? Because we want to test that too. Um, so what we need to do is to say you know, X dot and you know, it will tell you what you can do. So we are just gonna add a new element that is not an even number. Mm, one is not an even number. So all we have to do is to say add one to the set. So now that you can see how the set is listed. It has two, four, six, and then the one. And then I can go back to this particular long block here and we execute it because this time it should say false because it is not, not every element in X is an even number because now we have a odd number in the set, okay? So I just need to do the up arrow key, go back to that block, press the enter key, and now it returns a false because one is not a even number. Are we doing okay so far with this? All right. So if this block here is doing the for all, what about there exists? 
Okay, so we want to say we want to trial there exist. So in this case, we want to trial there exist uh, and look for things that are not even numbers. So we, if we're looking for things that are not even numbers, being odd numbers, all we have to do is to say, okay, instead of looking for a zero <coughs> after modding two, we're looking for something other than zero, which is one in this case, um, after the mod operation. Is that okay? But there are also a few changes that I need to make here. So the first thing is, if you're looking for there exist, then the initialization is false. Uh, can everybody still see the bottom? I think it's getting harder for people in the back. Let me uh, resize the browser so that you can see it a little bit better. Resize, unmaximize first. And now I have no idea where it went. All right, let me look for that. There we go. And I cannot tell where it is. That's not. Is that it? I think that is it. But we have to resize it. Oh, okay, I see. It's off the screen. Okay. Nope, can't move it that way. Let's try this. Move. Okay. And there we go. So I think people in the back can now see the entire thing again. All right, so the first thing we have to change is how uh, the default value is initialized. So if you're looking for there exists, okay, then the default answer is no, okay? So the answer is no unless you give me evidence that it is a yes, okay? So because of this change, we also have to change a few other things. Uh, what we are changing here is just this part here. Instead of anding everything, we are oring everything, okay? So if the original value of result is false, but throughout the elements, I find at least one case that turns result into true. Once result is true, it cannot be turned into false again because we are oring you know, with something else. So true or something is always true. So that's why you know, it's a one-way switch. Once, once you turn it to true, result cannot be false anymore. And that's all you need to do. So we have, this is for all, and this is there exist. They are very similar in terms of the control structure. What is different is how we initialize the default value and which operator we use to connect the result that we apply of the expression that we apply to each element, okay? So now we can test it, okay? So we press, I press the enter key and it says it's true, which is fine because one is an odd number, okay? Which is, that's why, that's why it returns a true. So now the question is, okay, we need to test it again, but with one removed from that set. I cannot remember everything, you know, all the methods related to a set. So I'm just typing X dot here to find out how we can remove that element of one. What, what, which method do you think I should use? Hmm? Delete, yeah. So we just say delete one, press the enter key. It says one, which means it, is, it successfully removed the element of one from the set. And we can always just type X by itself and it already shows your two, four, six, one is now gone. So now we can go back to the earlier block of code, the there exists code. Um, there we go. <clears throat> this code here, um, where the initialization is initializing result to false, and then we are using a logical or to apply, to connect the result of each element to the uh, ongoing result. And then we press the enter key again, and this time it returns false. So this is a demonstration of how you can look at the concepts of the universal versus the existential quantifier, but using things that you already know. Um, the only thing that is new to you in this case is the weird for loop here, you know, but it's just based on iterators. It's just going through every element in the set. So from that perspective, yes, it is a new syntax construct, but it is really just eye candy in this case. Are we doing okay so far with this explanation? Does it does it work with you? 
does it help you connect the kind of more abstract concept of the for all and the there exist you know to concepts that you already know which are you know, which are basically programming concepts we good okay so this is all getting recorded so if you you know, cannot you know type everything in because you're handwriting everything it's not a big deal you know just go back to the the lecture you know recording and um, it's there does everybody know where to find the lecture recording okay yeah I, I'm assuming the answer is yes, so I'm using the uh, I'm using this code here. Unless proven otherwise, I'm going to assume the answer is yes. For all student, student knows where to find my YouTube recording. <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay, so <clears throat> since I'm here already, I got to show you something that's really really cool. Because you can actually do the same thing. Okay, so let's think about just the existential quantifier, which is uh, the last block of code that we read. Okay, <clears throat> as it turns out, a set also has a um, oh, a set may not have that. Okay, x dot. Let me see. Does it have it? No, it does not. But well. Yeah, has doesn't do it, you know, but we can use values to do it. Okay, I'm not going to talk about it, you know, because, you know, that's kind of like a, another extension. I think this is already enough to illustrate the code version of the explanation of those two quantifiers. All right, so that's uh, the first thing I wanted to go over, and now we can get back to the usual topic. And last time we were talking about you know function as sets, and you have a homework assignment now. This is your new homework assignment due in a week, and it has to do with just functions. So it will basically only test you on okay, not test. This is an assignment, so it's only going to ask you questions about concepts of functions, which we are already which we have already introduced. Is that okay? Um, it's due next Wednesday at noon, so that means you have one week to work on this. Same deal, okay? Once you submit, you cannot resubmit, okay? So you can start today. You can start even now if you want to. Um, but don't turn it in. Don't submit it until you're 100% sure that you think those are the correct answers. Does anyone want me to go over the assignment that was due earlier today? Okay, I see some nods. So let's go ahead and do that. So the homework assignment that was due today was set notations as a homework assignment. Yep, I think this is it. Okay, so let's go ahead and open a new tab. And we can go over the questions one by one. Is that okay? Does everybody, can, can everybody still see the bottom? Okay. All right, so we're, let's work on the first question. A is a set of A, B as elements. B is a set of lowercase a, B, C as elements. Which of the following is true? The set A, uppercase, is an element of the set B. That is not the case because the entire set B does not have an element that is a set. Okay, so we know it's not the first one. Uh, B is an element of A, also not true, okay? Uh, C, the next question, the next option is A is a subset of B. I think that is the case, okay? So I'm just going to put a mark here, but I'm going to look at the fourth one too. Because, you know, just because I think one of the answers is the correct one does not mean that I did not make a mistake. So I have to double check and finish all the choices to and rule out the last one. B is a subset of A. That is not true because B has an extra element of C. So the correct answer is A is a subset of B. A is also a proper subset of B here. All right, moving on to question number two. Um, okay, this is a longer one. I hope everybody can still see the entire question. Given that A union B is A, B, C, D, E as a set, A minus B is the set of just you know, C, E, which of the following combinations of definitions of A and B satisfy this constraint? 
select every combination that meets the requirements or constraints. Okay, so let's find out. Um, a union B is A, B, C, D, E. A minus B is C and E, which means you know, uh, C and E should be, on, should, fa should be found only in A, but not in B. So if you look at this option here, can this be the answer? It cannot be the answer because in this case, A minus B would have been A, B, C, D, E. Let's take a look at this one. A has only C, E, and then B has A, B, and D. Can this be, okay, this meets all the constraints. What about this one? C and E are missing in A, so we know that it cannot possibly meet the requirements. This one, same thing, A is an empty set. It does not contain C or E, so it cannot meet this particular requirement. So we can rule this one out. What about this one here? A definitely has the elements of A, a C and E, uh, but it also has the element of A. But this one actually meets the requirement too, because A is also found in B. So that means you know, the elements that are uniquely in A are simply just C and E, because the element A does, not, does exist in B as well. Uh, here's the next one, okay? With this one, you know, we know it cannot be the answer because you know, A minus B would have been the empty set in this case. Uh, this one would also work, okay? Because you know, in this case, um, A, the set A and the set B has, a, has more overlap you know, because A, B, and D are overlaps between A and B, but you know, C and E are still uniquely in A, so this one would meet the requirement as well. This one will not meet the requirement because C and E are not uniquely in A, so the correct answer would be these three choices. Do we have any questions about this one? Okay, no questions. Moving on to question number three. Uh, choose the correct answer. A is an element of a set where it contains another set that has the element of A. The answer is false. Okay, very good. And in question number four, choose the correct answer. The set ABC is a subset of the set of ABC. It is true, okay? Now, if the symbol here is without that lower bar, then the answer would have been no, because without that little underbar, it means it's proper subset of, and in that case, uh, you need an extra, at least one extra element on the other side, or on the right-hand side. All right, question number five. Um, the union between the set ABC and the set AB is ABC. That is true. Question number six. Uh, what is the value of the following expression? I, I like these questions because this one does require you to think about the possibilities because I'm not telling you what is the set A nor the set B, okay? Which means they can be any set. Each one can be any set. So the expression is saying A minus B is an empty set implies that it is not the case that A is a subset, proper subset of B. So the question is, there you have three choices. The one, first one is true, regardless of how the set A and the set B are defined. The second one is it depends on, you know, how A and B are defined. And then the last one is uh, false, regardless of how A and B are defined. All right. So the first thing you need to do is to understand what it means, okay? Uh, a minus B being an empty set means, you know, there's nothing uniquely in A that is not in B, okay? Which is also known as what? There is one way to relate this statement using the concept of subset of, and which one is it? There's nothing in A that cannot be found in B, which means everything in A is in B, which means A is a subset of B, okay? So that's important because, you know, that helps you answer the question, you know, when we read the right-hand side of the implication. So you also have to remember what implication means. It is a Boolean operator, nothing more than that. All it means is a Boolean operator, and you can use the truth table to find out you know, the value of the operator once you know the two sides of the operator. 
on the other side, on the right hand side of the implication, we have basically, we have A is not a proper subset of B. So the whole thing boils down to A is a subset of B implies A is not a proper subset of B. So what do you think of that statement? Yep. I'm pretty sure it just depends on how they both define. Okay. So then you have to, so when you, before you, you kind of put that down as your answer, you have to find cases in that case, right? You know, so you have to say, okay, if I define A and B this way, then the implication is true. But if I define A and B this way, then the implication is false. So you have to you know, basically find cases like that. All right, so let's try to do that, okay? Let me just write it down on my tablet first, and then we'll go to the tablet for examples. So we have A minus B being the empty set implies it is not the case that A is a proper subset of B. Okay, so now we switch to the tablet. Okay, there we go. All right, so we know that this whole thing is really the same thing, okay, if and only if <clears throat> A is a subset of B. All right, so now the question is, can we find cases to make this true? Okay, well, I can find a case to make this true pretty easily. A and B are both empty sets, right? So we say, you know, when A is an empty set, B is an empty set, then the, okay, we'll, we'll call this, you know, expression W, okay? Then W is true. Okay, does that make sense to you? Because when A and B are both empty sets, any set is a subset of itself, okay? So we know the left-hand side of the implication is true. And then on the right-hand side, we, uh, a set cannot be its own proper subset, okay? We talked about that when we talked about the proper subset notation. So A is a subset, is a proper subset of B has to be false. It doesn't depend because they are the same set. But the negation of that has to be true. So now we end up with true implies true. And when you look at the truth table of implication, true implies true is true. The operator is going to return the value of true. Okay. So this whole thing is true. Okay. So we have a case for true. So now you have to try to find a case to make the implication false. The question is how can you make an implication false? Fortunately, there's only one way to make an implication false. It is when the left-hand side is true, but the right-hand side is false. So you have to find something where A is indeed a proper subset of B, but then A is, um, A is also a, A is, okay, I take it back, I misspoke. A is a subset of B, okay? You have to make a case where that is true. But you also have to make the A is a proper, subset, a is a proper subset of B true as well. That's not difficult to do. You know, if A is a proper subset of B, it is automatically A subset of B. So that means in this case, I can make A the empty set. I can make B a set with just a single element in it, okay? So in this case, the question is, um, A minus B is an empty set. Obviously true, because A is a sub is an empty set anyway. So A minus B has to be true regardless of how B is defined, okay? And then the other side is asking, first of all, is A a proper subset of B? Yes, A is a proper subset of B because um, it, B contains an extra thing, okay? But the negation of that is going to be false, which means we have true implies false. If you look at the truth table of implication, that is false the implication operator returns a value of false. So that means I can make it true, you know, in one case, I can make it false in the other case. When I say it, it is the implication operator. So that means the answer to this question is, uh, kind of depends on how A and B are defined. So the answer is, eh, depends. All right, question number seven. 
What is the value of the following expression? Kind of the same deal. In this case, it is true regardless of how A and B are defined. Is that okay? So if the intersection of two sets is the same as the union of the two sets, then the two sets have to be the same to begin with. Because if they're not the same, then the union is going to contain additional elements, which means you know, the equality to the intersection is not going to be true anymore because the intersection only contains elements that are common to both sets. The union says, you know, well, if you, can you can if you can find this element on at least one side of the union operator, it counts as part of the union. So that's why intuitively the answer is going to be true regardless of how you define A and B. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> and then in question number eight, what is the value of the following expression? Kind of the same deal. So A is an element of B automatically implies that A cannot be a subset of B. So once again, you have to say, okay, can I make this true? Can I make the implication true? And can I make the implication false? So let's go ahead and work on this one. I'm gonna work on it on the tablet, but I have to first copy the expression. A is an element of B implies it is not the case that A is a subset of B. Okay. So now I switch to the tablet view. There we go. <clears throat> all right. So first of all, can we make this implication true? There are many ways to make this implication true because if A is not an element of B to begin with, then the implication is true anyway. That's not really helpful. So we want to make... Uh, the implication true because both sides of the implication are true. So we want a definition of A and B such that A is a, an element of B and A is not a subset of B. Is that easy to do? Okay, so let's first make A an element of B. Okay, so we can define A as a simple set, okay, like the empty set. And then we can define B to be a set of just the empty set. So that would satisfy the left-hand side requirement because in this case, the set A is an element of the set B. Is that okay? And now we want to look at the right-hand side, okay? So in this case, A is an element of B is true. But what about A is a subset of B? A is a subset of B is true, so the negation of that is going to be false. So that means you know, we have an example of the implication being false. Okay, not quite exactly what I was shooting for because I was trying to make it true. So now I have to kind of flip the whole thing around and say, can I find a case where A is an element of B, but um, it is also true that A is not a subset of B? Wow, that is actually pretty easy to do, okay? So A is a set that only contains A in it. So it is a set. I need this to be an element of B. So that means B is a set where the only element of B is also a set that contains A as an element. Okay, so in this case, can I say A is an element of B? Yep, that is true. But can I say that A is a subset of B? Well, this is false. Okay, does everybody understand why A is a, is a subset of B is false? Because A and B contain different elements. The element A does not equal to the element of the set of A. They are two different things. Okay? So A is a subset of B is actually false. So that means the negation of A is a subset of B is true. So that means we have true implies true. So the implication operator returns a value of true. 
So once again, I can find one way to make the implication true. I can also find one way to make the implication false. So the answer is <laughs> depends on what A and B are. So if I switch back to the quiz, <clears throat> the answer is yeah, depends. All right, so is that okay? Does everybody understand how to work on these questions? And why the definition of the operators are very important? Okay, all right. So I just wanted to double check, okay, because you know, I can potentially make mistakes too. So did it, did it give me a score? I guess at the bottom. Oh, wait, wait. Okay, one, one, okay. Yep, well, okay, they're all green, we're good. All right. Are there any additional questions about this homework assignment? Nope, okay. Yep, go ahead. Yes, if the left-hand side of the implication is false, then the implication is true automatically. So that means it's really easy to make it true. Yep, you're correct. Hmm? Say that one more time, please. No. Well, if you can always make it, if you can, if you can always make it true, then the operator is not very useful, is it? So your question is, can we automatically exclude this as the possible answer? Is that correct? The answer is no, you cannot, because the only time you can exclude this one is really to show that you know um, you cannot make the left hand side true, but the right hand side false which is not trivial. There's, there's nothing trivial about you know, um, proving that the implication itself is false. You cannot automatically make that conclusion. Is there any reasoning that you think you can automatically make that conclusion that it's always false? Because I... Yes. So using that line of reasoning, yes, then you can rule out um, that it is always false. Yes. So both your answer and your suggestion are both correct. They're both valid, which means, you know, so the bottom line of both what, what, what you both are trying to talk about is, oh, since I can easily make a set A that is not an element of a set B, then I can easily say the you know, this thing can be true, so that means you know, it is always going to return false, it's not going to be a part of the answer, it's not the answer. Then, yes, okay. Yeah, so in this case, yes, so that reasoning works to automatic, to not automatically, but using that easy reasoning, you can rule out one of the three choices, yes. Very good. Any other comments, points? No questions, okay. All right, so I hope this homework assignment, you know, kind of forced some of you to actually study, you know, the notation, making sure that you understand all the notations, um, because we're gonna use those notations pretty much throughout the semester. You know, just, you know, spending the time to get to use, you know, to get to know those operators at this point of time is not a waste of time, okay? In fact, it is a good use of your time because we're gonna use them, you know, for a long time. All right, so that is that. Remember, you have a new homework assignment that is, that's due on the 7th. And what we'll do today is to finish up, well, I'm not sure how much time we have to do this, um, but I'm gonna take roll first, okay? Kind of like a transition. 
So we'll go ahead and take roll. Uh, it's already prepared here. I'm just unhiding it, but it's all, already out of time. I'm going to have to adjust the, the due date or the due time. Um, no, it's not out. You know, just not a whole lot. <laughs> uh, the access key is Hungarian. Okay, I'll explain why I use Hungarian as the access code. So I'm going to write it on the whiteboard first. Hungarian. Okay, there we go. And I'm going to extend the time a little bit. I know it's it's a little bit tight here. Okay, so we'll make it do at 55. Okay, save. There we go. All right, so if you refresh your browser, you should be able to get into the road taking activity, and Hungarian is the access code. So while you guys are doing this, I am going to go back to my notes and basically finish up the module that we were on earlier. And we're going to focus on the very last, uh, not this one. I think this one is just about functions as sets. Okay, there we go. It is this one. Okay. So I'm going to wait a little bit until everybody is ready. And then we'll talk about why the concept of a function as the way that we defined it is actually useful. All right. As far as I can... <coughs> Hungarian. With a lowercase h. <clears throat> Okay, are we, are you getting in? Okay, all right. So now I can check off my uh, Fitbit because it's reminding me to take roll. All right. So the question is, why is this important? The notation of set and the way we describe a function is important because functions are really useful. Now, you have taken you're pre-calc already, which means you already know algebra, uh, trig, and a lot of other things that make use of functions. So yes, in mathematics, functions are very useful, okay? But in computer science, in the context of this class, functions are useful in a way different kind of way, okay? So I'm going to describe why it is useful. So in this class, um, I just want to do this. How do we express an algorithm is sorting an array correctly. That's all I want. In other words, you know, let's imagine this is a homework assignment in CISP 360 or even 300, okay? I want to describe what your code is supposed to do, okay? I give you an array. The array is not necessarily sorted to begin with, and I want you to write the code to sort it, okay? But I want to describe the outcome. I want to describe what it means to have an array that is sorted. And you guys would think, that's easy. So let's, let's think of a few ways to describe it. And the way I, we are going to do that is to use the tablet here. OK, come on, switch to the next page. There we go. So one way to do it is say, OK, given array, I would just call it array A. Um, describe the outcome of an in-place sort algorithm. That's, ob that's the objective. This is what I want to achieve, okay? It's simply to say, I want you to write an in-place sort algorithm. I'll give you an array, and I want to describe the proper output of the algorithm, the proper outcome of the algorithm. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> and we are going to uh, assume the array has n elements just so that I don't have to use the bar bar notation all over the place, okay? So there are n elements in it. You go like, hmm, that is pretty easy. 
So the first attempt, okay, this is the first attempt, is to say for all i as an element of zero dot dot um, n minus two, we want a bracket i to be less than or equal to a bracket i plus one. Okay, let's just take a look at this notation here. I'm just being lazy here using the dot dot notation to specify a range of integers. So that means you know, the set in here is going to go to is going to contain zero, one, two, three, all the way up to n including n minus two. Not n minus one, but n minus two. Okay. The reason why it is ending with n minus two but not n minus one is because when I utilize the index i. I also specify i plus one, so that means you know i plus one itself has to be within the range of a valid index in the array. So that's that is also the reason why i cannot be n minus one because if i is n minus one, what is i plus one? It becomes n, and n is out of bound already because we start counting or we start indexing from zero. Okay. So you look at this and go like, oh, that seems pretty good. I mean, this seems to be a pretty good use of the notation that we have talked about in this class. So I'm going to give you an example, okay? So let's say the input, in case this is a bracket zero, this is a bracket one, a bracket two, and this is the initial, this is the, these are the final values, okay? So let's just say that initially we have, you know, the, the values of five, one, and two in the array, which is out of order, and you guys go like, I can eyeball this and sort it. You know, after sorting, we should have a bracket zero being a one, a bracket one being a two, and then a bracket two being five. Is that agreeable? That that should be the output? Yes? Yes? Why not? When i hits, mm, okay. So if you're referring to whether i is going through the correct range, let's think about this. Okay, in this case, what is n? What is how how many items do we have in the array? We have three, right? So that means your know, n minus two is one, so i can go from zero to one, but including that one, right? So when i equals to one, I'm comparing a bracket one against a bracket two, which is exactly what I need to do. Because I don't need to compare the last element with, quote unquote, the next element. There is no next element when you start with the last element as the first one. Yep. Okay. So if this is how I describe what your algorithm is supposed to do, the output, I can write a very simple loop here where the output or the final state is just zero, zero, and zero. You go like, but that's not sorting. You're just initializing an array to the same value. How is that meeting the criterion that we have just specified? Let me ask you this question. Is zero less than or equal to zero? is zero less than or equal to zero. Well, that quantified expression is true. I have met the requirement. I turn to this code. If the professor used only this particular expression to say what is the correct outcome of the algorithm, I have met that requirement. The professor cannot dock me any points, even though this definitely is not sorting. Are, are we understanding this? Okay, so the language is not specific enough. Okay, what is missing? How can we change the description of the proper outcome of an in place sort algorithm? so that it describes exactly what it needs to be. 
Okay, I'll, I'll briefly describe it using words. Okay, but we certain we right now we kind of lack the vocabulary to do it. Okay, which is the whole point of this discussion is yeah we kind of need to know how to use functions and understand properties of functions. So what we really want to say is every value from the initial value has to be in the final value somewhere. Does that make sense? But how do you express that? Mm. We actually kind of have a way to express it, but it's not specific enough. That is the reason why we have to introduce the additional concepts related to functions. Next question. But tech, everybody understands what sorting is. So why are we so hung up on sorting, describing the outcome of sorting? I'm only using it as an example. Okay, so <clears throat> let me pull this up again. You know, I've put this up before, but I want to put it up again. So we're looking at GitHub Copilot. Okay. So we'll just write, you know, read some, okay. Hi, Mona Lisa. I'm power, da, 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 da. okay, basically it is a way for you to describe what a function is supposed to do and leave it to Copilot of GitHub to actually write the code. <coughs> okay, that's pretty cool, right? So for simple stuff like sorting and whatnot, you know, I'm pretty sure you know, it will get the job done because you know, there are enough examples of sorting algorithms to train the neural net so that it understands, oh, this kind of code will do what, you know, what you're asking me to do. But when you have more complex things to specify, you know, to have Copilot to do the coding for you, how you describe the outcome of the algorithm now becomes really important because it is not a common thing that you can trust the LLM to understand. LLM is large language model. Is that okay? So even if, okay, even if you are allowed and you know, encouraged to use AI to help write code, the next challenge is how do you describe what that code is supposed to do? Am I doing okay so far? Okay, and how do you do that? How do you describe the outcome of a piece of code that you're asking the AI to write? How do you describe it in natural language? The answer is natural languages, regardless of which one you're choosing to use, is ambiguous. It is intrinsically ambiguous just because Normal people do not put parentheses around you know, parts of a sentence. Now, if we can do that, it can be less ambiguous, okay? But since we don't, that means you know, when you describe something using natural language, it is intrinsically ambiguous. And that's why we got legalese, because we are trying to reduce the ambiguity when we you know, write and understand legal documents. And, and it's not easy to understand because of that. So that means, okay, the mathematical language that we are learning right now is one way to proceed, okay? If you can precisely describe what the algorithm is supposed to accomplish, I don't care about how it is done. I just need to know what it is supposed to do. If you can describe that what it is supposed to do in a precise language that is not ambiguous, that cannot be interpreted in different ways, and it precisely describes what you want it to do, then we have a chance to have the AI to actually do the coding because now it understands, it can even test, okay? Uh, let me test this code. It doesn't quite accomplish what we want to do. Let's try this code. It doesn't you know, accomplish what we want it to do. This is why this topic is important, okay? Why this class is important in the age of AI because the AI can help you write some code, but it cannot do that if you cannot describe what that code is supposed to do. And unlike a person, okay, you know, at least at this point in time, maybe it will change in the future, but at, le at this point in time, the AI cannot come back to you and say, okay, what you just said, I have six ways of interpreting what you just said. Um, 
this, 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 and this. Which one do you mean exactly? I don't think the AI is quite at that point to understand that, oh, okay, this is ambiguous. I can interpret in different ways. Which one do you mean? People can do it, but I don't think the AI can quite do that. It's really quite the opposite. It would choose one of those ways and be very convinced that that is the way that you want me to do it. Okay? So that is part of the reason why I think this class is important. It is training you to think in a very logical and precise way and describe things in a way that is not ambiguous. And you would th say, but that's, that's a math class. As I said many times already, computer science is a subfield of applied mathematics. As much as some of us do not want to believe that, it is the truth. All right, so given that, <clears throat> okay, so I gave you a few more examples here and so on. You know, um, this is the reason why I use the Hungarian as the access code today. Because if you go to YouTube, okay, let's just say that you're taking an algorithm class like CISP, I think 430 or 400, I cannot remember. Which class talks about quick sort versus merge sort versus selection sort and stuff like that? Hmm? 360, okay. Hmm? 430, okay. So I guess it depends on the complexity because merge sort is not an easy algorithm to understand. Uh, quick sort can be done recursively and recursion is usually not, people don't get into recursion as much you know, in CISP 360, but they do get into recursion a lot in 430. Regardless, okay? If you have trouble in, you know, envisioning or you know, visualizing the sorting algorithms, there are YouTube videos to illustrate how sorting algorithms work in the form of Hungarian dance. Do you guys know about that? Yes? Okay, very good. So you can look up on YouTube and just look up Hungarian quick sort. And it will give you a video with Hungarian dancers in full costume, but with a number on their costume and they would do this Hungarian dance and then, you know, and to illustrate how a sorting algorithm works. It's really quite entertaining and at the same time educational. So that's why I chose the word Hungarian as today's access code. Yeah, I know it's not entirely relevant to the discussion, but it's good to explain that, okay. So this concludes you know, the function you know, uh, discussion but we are not done with functions because this is the next module and I certainly hope that some people had the time to read ahead a little bit. So when we have a function, we also can describe the function as an injection, a surjection, or a bijection, or none of the above, okay? So this is the, what we're gonna talk about from here on is what makes a function an injection? What makes a function a surjection and what makes a function a bijection, okay? So we'll go through these notes here. We'll start with uh, injection. All right, so injection, an injective function, otherwise known as an injection, has each element of the domain mapped to a unique element in the codomain. So in English, this is how I would describe an injection. So in other words, an injection has to be a function first, okay? Things that are not functions, we don't even consider you know, whether it's an injection, surjection, or bijection. Okay, so you have to start with a function for this to make any to make any sense. So before we read the obscure, you know, uh, you know, description here, I'll show you a few things. You know, one, some are injections and some are not injections. And to do that, I'm going to use Joplin, you know, just because you know, it's quicker to type in this case in Joplin than to hand write everything in the tablet. Um, so I started this already. I just need to get rid of these two, okay? So we'll take a look at a, at a few examples, okay? So we'll start with um, Okay, assume x is the range 
and um, in this case x equals 2. I'm just using this as an example. Um, let's say it's just 1, 2, and 3. And assume y is the codomain. And I'll define y as another set. Uh, we'll give it a, b, and c. Okay. So this is our first example as a function. So we know this function must have exactly three elements, right? How do we know that? If x is the range and x has three elements, we already have determined the cardinality of the function because every element in the domain has to map to one and only one element in the codomain. So that means the number of two tuples in the function has to be exactly the, exactly the same as the number of elements in the domain. What about the codomain? Eh, that's not important, at least you know, not in terms of determining the number of items in the function itself. All right, so we are going to start with you know, mapping one to, uh, one to A, okay, and then we map uh, two to B, and then we map three to C, okay. So in this case, is this an injection? It is a function for sure, okay, but is it an injection? In other words, does every element in the domain map to a unique element in the codomain? Okay, all right, this is an injection, okay, is an injection. All right, so I'm just being lazy, doing some copy and paste here. What about this? Is that an injection? Yep, go ahead. Say again? Yes, yes, the, yeah. so the bullet points, you know, you know illustrates that you know, we are still using X being one, two, three as the range, and y being the codomain. Okay, so what about the second item? Is the second item an injection? Well, first of all, before we even try to determine whether it's an injection, is it a function? Assuming that we want x to be our domain and y to be our codomain, is that even a function? Yeah, it is a function. Um, you know, it's just uh, the question now is, is it an injection? In other words, is every element in the domain mapping to a unique element in the codomain? No, because you know, we can see how two and three are both mapping to the same element in the codomain, B, and therefore this is not an injection, okay? So we'll say that this is not an injection. All right, is that okay so far? All right, so I'm gonna change the assumption a little bit and then I'll ask you know, some additional questions. So assume you make another assumption this time and this time I'm just expanding Y to include an element D. And we'll just look at this example here. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, all right, so is this set of two tuples, can it be interpreted as an injection in this case? First of all, is it still a function? Now remember, this time I am putting one more item into the codomain, which is D, and we have one mapping to A, two mapping to B, and three mapping to C. D in the codomain is just kind of hanging out by, by itself, not being mapped to. Is this still a function? It is still a function because in order to be a function, all you need to make sure is every element in the domain maps to one and only one element in the codomain. It doesn't say anything about whether all elements in the codomain needs to be mapped to or not. Okay, so this is still a function, but is it an injection? Does it meet the requirement that every element in the domain maps to a unique element in the codomain? It still meets that requirement, okay? Because A is different from B, is is also different from C, B is different from A, which is still also different from C, and so on, okay? So it still meets the requirement. So now we say, 
is a is an injection injection there we go all right so these are just examples to illustrate what an injection is okay so i think you have an intuitive understanding of an injection now okay but i want to describe this using a mathematical expression okay give me a set of two tuples that is known to be a function to begin with what mathematical expression can I use to confirm that it is also an injection? That is what I'm asking for. So there are a few ways to do it, okay? Getting back to the notes here. Uh, the first way is actually the most intuitive way to do it. It is basically saying for all P in X, for all Q in X, which means P and Q are both elements coming from X, they can be the same element, but by the time we get to the innermost part of this expression, then it says P does not equal to Q implies F of P does not equal to F of Q, and F is the function that is in question right now, okay? Is that saying the same thing? Is it really saying the same thing as every element in the domain needs to map to a unique element in the codomain? Yep, it's basically saying the same thing, just using a different notation. Because in this case, I'm using the conventional notation of the application of function f. Are we doing okay so far with this? All right, okay. So the other way to do this is to do something that we have done already. Remember the qualification of a set of two tuples that is a subset of the Cartesian product between the domain and the codomain? That was, that was a long sentence, but that captures what exactly what I needed to say. So if you look at this one here, what is it really saying, okay? So let's try to interpret it because you know, that's also you know, the objective of this class is when you see something like this, do you know what it means? So we start with for all Q in Y. So what that means is, you know, going back to the example that we showed earlier, that I showed earlier, let me go back to that example in JavaScript, okay? Remember the JavaScript example that we saw earlier? Okay, maybe not this one. Yeah, this one, okay? So we are still basically looking at the same kind of loops here, okay? And this time we are looking at this kind of a loop, okay? Because this is the for all kind of loop. So now what are we doing with the for all thing? Okay, there we go, okay. So we are saying for all Q in Y, which is the codomain, okay? In other words, I'm asking for everything in the codomain, blah, 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 okay? Okay, let's figure out what that blah, 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 blah is. So the way to understand the blah, 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 blah is you can either read it from outside in or you can read it from inside out, but don't try to jump between you know, those two approaches. So I'm going to go for the outside-in approach. So the outside-in approach says, I don't care what this thing is, it gives me a number, a value, a numerical value. And I'm just comparing to one to see if this whole thing is less than or equal to one, or at the most one, basically. Is that okay? So the next question is, what, am I, what are you comparing to one and try to make sure that that quantity is either a zero or a one? Well. Then we look into the bar bar notation. The bar bar notation in this class is cardinality, which means I'm counting the number of elements of whatever is inside the bar bar notation. Okay? So now we look into the braces because the braces define, okay, the elements are the membership of elements is described as follows. Okay? That's basically what this notation is trying to say. So we, we're constructing a set on the fly, okay? You can call it an ad hoc you know, set where each element is a two tuple, uh, PQ. But Q is already chosen by this time because Q is the variable determined by the outer loop of the for all thing. So Q is already chosen. We know Q is coming from Y. P is not, okay? P is quote unquote free or unbound. So P can be whatever, but 
PQ as a two tuple has to satisfy this one single requirement, which is it has to be an element of F. F is a function, but we see a function as a set of two tuples. So all this is really asking for is, okay, give me all the two tuples where Q as an element of the codomain is mapped to. And I'm counting how many, th how many two tuples meet that requirement. And I want that count to be less than or equal to one. In other words, do not exceed one. It can be zero, it can be one, but it cannot be two. So this is looking at things from the perspective of the elements of the codomain. And I'm asking, so how many things from the domain is mapping to you? You know, one element can, okay, let's go back to the example that we were looking at because you know, it's helpful to kind of switch to that at this point. Nope, not that one. Um, it's in Joplin. So switch to Joplin, there we go. All right, so from the perspective of this example here, where there are four elements in the codomain. So if you pick D, okay, to be the Q variable earlier in that expression, and you ask, hey, element D in the codomain, how many things are, being, are mapping to you in this particular function? What do you think is the answer? Zero, right? Is zero less than or equal to one? Yep, so we're good. Um, let's pick B as the element being looked at. So we're looking at B, and you're asking the element B, how many things in this function is mapping to you? One, one is less than or equal to one, so we're still good, okay? So now you switch gear a little bit, and then you look at this particular example here. So if we look at this example here, then you ask C, okay? You ask C and you say, how many things are being mapped to you? C says nobody, okay, because you in, okay, let me point out which function. In this particular function, nothing maps to C. So C is fine, okay, not a problem. The problem is with B, because if you ask B and you ask how many things are being mapped to you from the domain, two. Two is not less than or equal to one, so that means we have one case within the for all where the expression returns a value of false. But you only, it only takes one false in that loop to make the result false. Once it is false, you cannot turn it back into true. So let's go back to the code because I want to reconnect everything to the JavaScript code. So if we are to reconnect to the JavaScript code, which is here, and this is the code that I am referencing. This is the for all, okay? So if once result becomes false, because whatever you're evaluating here turns out to be false, it cannot be true again, because the only thing we can do to the result is to take whatever it is currently is and end it with something. If result is false already, then we end up with false and whatever. False and whatever is guaranteed to be False, exactly. So that means you know, once you find a counterexample in a universal quantifier, then we guarantee that the, universal quant the universally quantified expression or the whole expression is going to be false. Is that okay? All right. So I know we are running out of time. We are out of time. So we, this is Wednesday already. I won't see you guys in the next, what, five days, which means, okay, finally, I, we, we don't, I don't have to worry about 440 anymore. No, not really. <clears throat> so try to review the material we have talked about so far. Read ahead of me, okay? Read ahead of the class lecture. Um, just finish the entire module, which means you want to cover surjection and also bijection in the module that I'm reading from, okay? So on Monday, we can talk about surjection and also bijection, all right? And don't forget the homework assignment due next Wednesday at noontime. So there are, there's stuff for you guys to do over the weekend. All right, otherwise, have a nice weekend, and I'll see you next Monday.
I just wanted to clarify on some of the notation here. Uh-huh. So for this last one right here, when you say there, um, 